the supplementary, which is... Oh, sorry. No, that's fine. Oh, done. Uh, oh. No, no, no. I'll put them somewhere. Right, there it is. Okay. So the first item is the um, residential red zone offer um, recovery plan um, comments. And uh, I, I will move that. And do I have a seconder for that? Glenn Livingston. Um, I, I have, um, in terms of this particular paper, because it's in my name, I thought that I'd just explain why it's come uh, so late in the piece. Um, on this particular recovery plan, the, uh, the Crown put a preliminary draft plan out for public comment. And my recollection is that there were something like 800 submissions came in um, on the on the um, on the preliminary uh, recovery plan. And so, after those were processed, uh, this uh, draft residential red zone offer recovery plan uh, came out, but only allowed two weeks for submissions. So. I was completely unaware that the submissions close today at five o'clock. So I do apologise to councillors that it is so late, um, and that's why I emailed you all a copy yesterday and asked you to read it carefully, because it does contain um, you know, some issues that have been in the public arena, and I don't know whether this would be something that the Council would have commented on in the past, but I think it's absolutely vital that we comment on it. Um, the staff provided comments on the preliminary draft because they felt that it was important to record the Council's interest in the recovery plan, given our obligations in relation to infrastructure provision, our financial contribution to Crown property purchases on the Port Hills, and our role in aiding the recovery of the citizens of Christchurch from the effects of the earthquakes. And um, I think that the, the point that I've made in this is that it would have been better to have a more collaborative approach from the outset. And you know, people might recall that I said on, or asked a question of staff on uh, Friday last week at the district plan review, would it have been better if we'd sat down and worked through the the residential red zone um, proposition with Sarah and perhaps address some of the uh, um, you know, uh, sea level rise and or coastal erosion and inundation and uh, flood risk issues at the same time, um, obviously dealing with those in the, in the way that we would be able to deal with them as opposed to um, the earthquakes issue. But recognising that some of those issues were clearly um, directly affected by the um, earthquake itself may have been able to be included within the recovery um, planning process. Um, and, and the answer to that question was yes, that would, have been, uh, that would have been good. So I think it's important to make that point. Um, in terms of the questions that the draft residential red zone recovery plan um, or red zone offer recovery plan, um, um, what it asks for is it asks for the um, whether we agree with the Chief Executive's preliminary view on a new offer um, to buy vacant red zone land, and yes, um, the proposal is that yes, it, it's the same offer that was made to insured residential red zone homeowners. Um, two, do you agree with the Chief Executive's preliminary view on a new offer to buy insured commercial red zone properties? Yes, it's the same offer. It, that was made to insured residential red zone homeowners. So I'll just skip three for a minute because that's the substance of the report. Um, four, do you agree with the Chief Executive's preliminary view on a new offer to buy Rapaki Bay red zone properties? And I've actually, um, it's kind of almost like kick for touch here because I don't know the answer to this question um, and we really haven't had an opportunity to formulate a view 
believe that the principle sh that should apply is consistency with the position on the offer that ought to be made to uninsured homeowners and is in accordance with the Crown's obligations under Te Tiriti o Waitangi, because um, obviously land swapping is one of the um, proposals in there so that land that is not suitable for development because of rockfall risk could be um, swapped for uh, for other land, and I, I mean, as a matter of principle, I do support the idea of um, land swapping. Um, do you agree with the Chief Executive's preliminary view on a new offer to buy insured privately owned red zone off properties? Yes, it may be that um, people would wish to review their position in light of the issues discussed above with reference to matters set out in the Supreme Court judgment, and that's basically saying that um, in some parts of the residential red zone it ain't very pleasant to be living at the moment. So that was... Um, that was why people may want to review that at this stage. It's, it remains a voluntary offer. And I, so let's go back to three, and I'll, I'll walk through that, and I'm happy to answer any question. Um, I believe that the council needs to take the view that Sarah is wrong to discriminate against residential red zone homeowners who, for whatever reason, found themselves uninsured at the time of the earthquakes. And... There was a feeling that I had reading through the the, um, the draft uh, recovery plan that there was a selective quoting from the Supreme Court judgment. So I've read that judgment in great detail, and I know it's a majority decision, which means that there were other judges that sat on the bench that felt otherwise in terms of the process that ought to have been adopted. But what the Supreme Court said was that the government should have done a recovery plan. And the reason they should have done a recovery plan was that it allowed for public engagement. It allowed for a submissions process that simply wasn't there. I mean, I remember what it was like to receive, um, you know, I mean, I, I was in a privileged position being a member of parliament. I had notice before you know, we had a meeting before the actual announcement was made. But for most people, they heard it on the news, they saw it on the internet, they found out that their homes were going to be red zoned um, uh, by public announcement. There's no question that a lot of wraparound support was offered to people um, around that time, but there was no engagement, no to and fro, no real debate about it. There were um, the opportunity was allowed for a um, review of the decisions that had been made um, and a small group was set up to review the red zone boundaries. Um, but again, um, not so much a general submissions process and certainly not around the offer that was made to allow people to um, uh, move on. Um, and what the, what the draft paper does... And, and I don't think that this is, and I'm not saying this in a negative way, I'm just saying that there's, there seems to be a misunderstanding about what we should be comparing. So, you know, I was red zoned, so I was insured. So if my neighbour was not insured, is the right comparison my neighbour and me? Is that the right comparison? Because... May, offering my neighbour the same as me doesn't diminish what I've been offered. It doesn't change what I've been offered. It doesn't affect what I've been offered. So why is it right to compare what I've been offered with my neighbour? And should my neighbour be... Um, should my neighbour not be um, offered the same because they were uninsured? I know the story of a neighbour where um, the husband uh, didn't agree with insurance. He'd had a fight with the insurance company and he refused to insure the pop property. She was desperate about that, but, you know, that was, that was the way things were in their household and, and it had been for a number of years. Um, sadly, he passed away and she immediately started to set about to get insurance for her house. Now, she was comparing a number of insurance companies. On Friday, the 3rd of September, 2010, she decided which company she was going to, and she made an appointment to see them on Monday. 
She was uninsured. Why should she get less than me? You know, so I, you know, I do feel emotional about these particular cases, but it's because I have listened to the personal stories of people who didn't self-insure. They didn't deliberately not insure. There were people's stories over and over again who just simply didn't have insurance on the day that the earthquake happened. So my view is, is that we should compare apples with apples. Let's compare two uninsured houses, but one in the red zone and one in the green zone. And so we've attached the story of one of the ones in the green stone to the submission. And we've got a, a picture of the Governor-General. Governor-General helps out in Aranoi, and there he is, helping out in Aranoi. And here's some quotes from him. Some of the people that Habitat for Humanity are helping are at their wit's end. For them, there seems to be no way for their problems to be resolved. And then to have these strangers turn up at the doorstep full of compassion and wanting to help them, it's fantastic and moving. And for most of them, it does get emotional. Most of the volunteers are from Christchurch and they're dealing with their own challenges. The whole thing is very much about communities helping each other. The difference between being red zoned, uh, um, in, being red zoned and green zoned, or the difference between being uninsured in the red zone and uninsured in the green zone, is that the possibility of compassion, the possibility of neighbours helping, of communities helping, of Habitat for Humanity helping, and Habitat for Humanity was funded by the New Zealand Red Cross. It was funded by contributions that came from all around the country and from overseas. It was funded by what was known as the Prime Minister's Fund. They didn't sit in judgment of people who didn't have insurance, and neither should the government. So that's the position that I have presented in this paper, and I'm seeking um, support uh, from you for it. The Supreme Court decided that we shouldn't make a judgment about the individuals. They could, the government could. They could go up individual by individual. We could, but they went through the fact that they knew of cases where there was not a conscious choice not to insure their properties. A couple who paid insurance premiums religiously but we're in the process of having a financial advisor package up a complete insurance offer for everything with a four-day gap before the September 2010 earthquake. A couple who had overlooked changing insurance cover into their name because of stress from a cancer diagnosis and caring for dependent family members. This couple was insured at the time of the September uninsured at the time of the September 2010 earthquake, and their insurance company had refused cover, even though they had had insurance with the company since 1972. A claimant who had understood that insurance was in the hands of her bank, and a claimant who had not paid his insurance premiums for two months prior to the earthquake by oversight. These are the real human stories that sit behind why people were uninsured on the 4th of September. There aren't many of them. There aren't many of them in the red zone and there aren't many of them in our country because earthquake um, cover um, comes from that insurance. People who have mortgages are required by their banks to take out insurance. And maybe banks should be a little bit more vigilant by requiring people to maintain insurance and ensuring that they're maintaining insurance <laughs> during the course of the um, mortgage. The owner of a house in the red zone with a 2007 valuation of $300,000 would receive an offer from the government of just over $70,000 for their house. This is 80% of the land value only based on this draft plan. Somebody who was um, uninsured in the green zone could have the Governor General come and help repair their house and Habitat for Humanity repair dozens of houses in the green zone for people who were uninsured. 
So I think that it's much more important that we look for fairness and consistency, that we look for the possibility of compassion by assisting people um, in this situation. And the last thing that I want to say is that there is a footnote in the Supreme Court case which I'm surprised hasn't really been focused on, and it was a surprise to me when it was pointed out. And it states this, we note that an internal SARA paper dated June 2011 enumerated one of the cons of developing a recovery plan as being that there may be a community expectation that their views may change decisions. The Supreme Court said that the requirement of the Act that such important decisions should involve community input is not just a matter of procedural form, it's a matter of substance. The legislative history made it clear that Cantabrians were to have input into the rebuilding of their communities and basically any argument that consultation would have made no difference carries little weight. And I think we should say as a council it carries little weight with us too. The thought that the Crown might have closed its mind to anything that the community thought about what was an appropriate way to address the challenges of these damaged areas that were people's homes, neighbourhoods and communities is very, very hard to accept. So I'm seeking the endorsement of Council for this um, submission to be made by five o'clock today in the name of the Council. Um, Glenn and Paul, Yanni, Andrew. Um, Thank you. Um, as a representative of uh, one of those uh, of the, an area made largely red, I would like to endorse that and uh, have it noted that I think, well, in my view, the insurance struggles that people have had post-quake bear out that argument that insurance companies were... No, no carry on. You're talking about something else? Yeah. ...were difficult to deal with before the quakes. Uh, and after, and that there actually were a lot of people twixt and tween, and that offer, if you call it an offer, people were handed down the phone to actually leave their house, so I'm not sure you call it an offer, um, wasn't reasonable. Underneath the quote about the Governor-General, I noticed there the problem with the approach uh, talks about people being on the other side of a fence or a road. If we look at, for instance, a, a street not far from uh, where we live in that Horseshoe Lake area, uh, Deville Place, that's literally the case. One side is red, one is green, and those sort of scenarios are quite plausible there. That final comment you made before uh, about uh, community input Sounds a bit like an ECAN-ism to me, you know. Trust the people. The people actually know what they want. They know who they want for their elected representative. Um, you know, to open it up, to consider the possibility that the community could have a view or, or even change things. It's quite staggering. So I, I strongly support your submission. Um, yeah, Paul. Yeah, I will be supporting the recommendation. I just want to ask a question with, uh, in relation to what difference does it make to the government whether they're insured or not? Does it actually make a difference at all? Yes. Um, it depend, um, if, if the property is um, insured, then uh, the amount that the Crown can claim back from the insurance, obviously, is increased and they can claim for the land damage from EQC. Yanni? Thank you. Um, I, I just kind of appreciate the work you've done on it and much of the sentiment that you've made. Just um, two questions I had. One was, um, did you consider that council should actually be given the red zone offer? Seems kind of like bizarre that we've um, given away a whole bunch of our social housing through the cost share and we never got an offer for our social housing. Which I've is, raised that separately yeah. with the government. Why would we not put it in here? Because it's... Um... I mean, if the principle applies that we want it, you know, we want people to be Well, we weren't uninsured. We weren't uninsured, but because we were a local but the, it's body... Not, it's not in scope. But why not? Well, because we... 
We're not the, we're, this is only focused on uninsured business and um, empty sections. That's all it's focused on. It's but not. Is there anything else you think should be taken into account? No, no, but this is what the, I mean, I've, I've, I've tried to keep, these are the specific questions we were asked, and, and we that. are not, we were Sorry. not uninsured. No, no, but if you look at five, do you agree with the Chief Executive Preliminary View on the new offer to buy insured privately owned red zone properties? We say yes. Um, six, is there anything else? So I think there is scope in here to make that point. It was signed off on the cost share agreement. I have a process in place where we are um, raising all of these issues, and as I've already informed councillors, this is one of the issues that we've raised with central government, that we wish to review the fact that all of our social housing um, was, uh, was handed over to the Crown without any compensation. Yeah, but... Surely this I'm is not going to put it. No, I, I, I think it's a wrong process to do, because this is all about. I mean, the real issue here is the fact that um, uninsured um, improved red zone properties are not being offered 100% of their capital value, and I think that it's important to remember that the reason that we are making the submission is to advocate for our ratepayers who are equally deserving of treatment, because, equal treatment, because they are equally ratepayers. Whether they are insured or not is irrelevant to the question. And I don't think it's appropriate to raise a separate issue that we've already raised with central government other than through the um, process that I've outlined. I think that's the distinction between the ratepayers and... Yeah. Well, if you look at um, the first paragraph, I mean, I, I, well, we can debate it, that's, that's fine. Um, the, the second question I really had was around, um, have we had any economic analysis of the value of the way in which the red zone offer has, has, has been conducted? Have we had any sense of how much government have received, what's happened in terms of the take, take up? No. So um, I do think that that's um, of interest. Uh, I know that at one of the briefings that we had from one of the insurance companies, uh, we were advised that in some instances the Crown would have received more than yeah. they paid out under option one, which was um, certainly not impossible in my view, but um, was a surprise to me that there were a number. So, I mean, that, that will be um, of interest, I think, to a number of people. Um, particularly those that sold their houses for less than they would have got had they um, had they actually um, settled with the crown for option two. Um, so, uh, and I think that as far as the land goes, uh, the agreement that was signed for option two uh, was that if the crown received more from EQC for land damage, then they would pay the difference to the homeowner, to the former homeowner. It had an impact on our rating base of two billion, though, in the LTP. That's uh, noted that we we uh, lost valuation of two billion. Yeah, that's result. right, and um, it's been a significant. Um, I did actually go online to see what my new rating valuation oh, was right. for my section: nine thousand dollars <laughs> for five hundred and forty square metres. <laughs> Yeah, so, but that's a significant impact on our rating base. So I think, you know, it's right to raise it. It's a, um, it, it has had a huge difference on our balance sheet. Um, Andrew. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to make some um, comments and maybe a couple of suggestions around paragraph four in the submission. Um, the What's described here is the Rapaki Bay red zone properties. Ah, now, um, the... This is quite unique in terms of the issues canvassed in the draft recovery plan and also quite unique in, in terms of some of the red zone considerations and there's been considerable frustration to the people that, um, that are involved with, with this within the Rapaki community. Now, the first point I would make is that until I read the draft submission from government, from CIRA, I'd never heard the settlement at Rapaki referred to as Rapaki Bay. Rapaki Bay is the geographical feature, which is the inlet where the water comes into the land. Um, the settlement is Rapaki, or otherwise known as the Rapaki Pass. So I would suggest 
Um, and again, you know, that community would never refer to that place as Rapaki Bay. They would refer to it as Rapaki or Rapaki Pa. So I'd suggest we, we ourselves drop the, the word bay from our submission um, yep. out of sensitivity to that community and also the fact that we have that local knowledge. Um, and I've got a copy of the topo map in front of me, in fact, and it shows it exactly the way I've described it. So if I change it to formulate a view on the Rapaki offer, noting that the reference to Rapaki Bay um, does not accurately describe the area. Correct, yep. And if we just drop the word bay in both the, the, the title of paragraph four and in the substantive paragraph itself. Well, no, but that's the question that they're asking. All oh, right, so, okay, So good. I'll put yep. quote marks around bay. Yep. Yep. Excellent, okay. thank you. And then the second point, I mean, I appreciate that um, Council hasn't had an opportunity to formulate a view on the, the Rapaki offer, um, but I wonder whether our paragraph goes far enough in terms of sensitivity to the particular nature of the tenure and use of this land. And I'm wondering whether we could just insert some additional wording, again, um, picking up points that are made in the CIRA document, um, but something along the lines of, um, in accordance with the Crown's obligations, so I think we need to go far further than suggesting it's just obligations under the treaty mm -hmm. that we should be looking at. So that the offer ought to be made to ensure um, should apply as consistency with our permission on the offer that should be made that ought to be made to uninsured homeowners. So put um, another put another thing there. Yep, so put so a comma and comma fully takes into account yep. and acknowledges the implication of the Tanga Tuko Iho hey, nature wait, 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 of the wait, land. Wait, 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 Fully takes into account and acknowledges the implications of. Yep. The Taonga Tuku Iho, and maybe we can put in brackets, handed down from each generation, close bracket, nature of the land. And it just means that not only do we say there are obligations under the treaty, but we say that there are particular sensitivities and particular cultural considerations that need to be taken into account, which may be over and above. So handed down from each generation. Close bracket. Yep. Um, nature of the land. Yep, great. Thank you. Yep, that's great. Thank you. Anyone else? I'll open it up for debate then. Glenn? I think I've said my bit as yeah. I did before and that the case uh, over insurance is very strong and that this side of uh, the quakes uh, proves that. Insurance companies have always been difficult to deal with. And that's why we had to push. It was outside of core council business, but that's why we pushed for insurance advocacy and resolution. We shouldn't have. Yeah, great. Um, Yanni. Um, I strongly support making this request. Um, I tried to do this as part of the cost share. Unfortunately, council didn't endorse that at the time. Um, but I do note that this has caused huge grief and anxiety to a number of people in our community who were worst impacted on by the earthquakes. And I do think we have a moral obligation to advocate strongly on their behalf for the right thing to occur. Um, having said that, I'm really disappointed that we're not requesting around our social housing, because when you look at this offer being extended to commercial, um, and also comment made at the start around um, looking at um, opportunities for uh, people that haven't taken up the offer to be extended, I think it actually makes sense. Um, I appreciate that we're going to raise that through another forum. But if I go back to what's at the heart of my support for the submission in the main, it is the fact that everyone should be tre tre treated fairly. And I don't think it's fair that we didn't receive an offer for our social housing on red zone land. We didn't make the choice to red zone that land and we've lost about $15 million worth of property as Net a result. Eight. So eight million. Net. Right. So um, it just seems to me that, you know, if you take the point that this should be done for the basis of fairness, um, because outside of people's control, there was a red zone process that had no community input into it, then I can't understand why we wouldn't include our own social housing. It seems odd. Um, that that was able to be um, given away basically for free without any 
public consultation, any public discourse. And in fact, ironically, reflecting on the discourse we've had subsequently, we've seen that people felt really strongly that we shouldn't be disposing of our social housing land. So um, I'm happy to support the submission. I endorse the comments that have been made. Um, and I welcome this council uh, um, looking at taking a new position than it previously had un under the last term of council. Um, and I'd encourage you all to support it. Um, I guess I don't want to vote against it. So, you know, I'd like to move that we make the offer as an amendment for the um, our, our own residential property within the red zone. Um, I'll appreciate if there, you know, maybe a second or maybe not. Unfortunately, because this came late, we haven't really had a chance to have this in, discussed informally. Is there a seconder for that um, amendment? <coughs> There isn't, so thank you. Um, Andrew and then Ali. Thank you, I'm um, really pleased to support this submission. Um, some of the issues dealt with here are um, examples of, you know, certainly not good practice. Um, there, there are issues here that have been dealt with that have been inherently unfair, um, that have produced some horrendous outcomes and huge amounts of unnecessary stress and anxiety to some of the people already worst affected by the earthquakes in terms of the, the stress and the distress that the earthquakes caused. So, um, you know, to, to be submitting here on aspects of a process that added to that stress and distress for many people. And, you know, where that stress is still ongoing a number of years later, um, I, I totally support the approach that's been taken here. Um, and the paragraph on page three that kind of sums this up for me, um, the situation is now dire for those who cannot afford to accept the offer. The residential red zone land clearances have created an untenable position for many who remain not as a matter of choice, but because they cannot afford to accept the offer. Um, people really living in a way that they would never ever have dreamed of and have been put in a position that they haven't been able to get out of purely because of the, the circumstances that hopefully um, response to submissions like this will um, resolve. So I'm very pleased to support this submission and the tone of it and I encourage councillors to, um, to do the same. Ellie. I just want to endorse that as well and uh, uh, thank you for your work that you've put into it. I think this is the first time that I've seen the issue so succinctly uh, put in one place and not only based on fact with the, the backup of those facts but the humanity that's in it as well and um, communicating that was, this was inherently unfair on so many levels, but how that affected people who were already in a, a very dark and stressful place. So um, I just wanted to thank you for the work that's gone into this, and I'll certainly be um, supporting it today too. I'll um, close that off. I, um, I've actually been quite um, shocked in one way at the number of people who've judged people who were uninsured. The reason that people are being asked to accept an offer is because the land was red zoned, not because they were uninsured. If they were uninsured in the green zone, they could have got help, compassionate help, from people whose reason for being is to help others. Um, the number of people who've said to me, well, it's good the government's increased the offer from 50% to 80%, but actually that's only of the land value, not the whole value. So how can you move on if you get 80% of your land value, and land values in parts of the East are very low, as I know. <laughs> so I think that it's really important to remember that we should not be falling into the trap of judging people for circumstances that, that none of us um, completely understand. And I think that um, there was absolutely no reason, the court went through this, there is no reason to do a case-by-case -case assessment of whether a case is a deserving one or not. And that's, when I've spoken to people, I've said to people, look, people were in this situation because of this or because of that, you know somebody who was in hospital and the bills just didn't get paid, they piled up. You know, so 
all of these reasons why things happen, do we do a case-by-case -case assessment of whether a case is a deserving one? Habitat for Humanity and its funders and volunteers did not judge people in this way, and neither should the government. Um, there is no moral hazard in implementing government policy fairly and consistently across the areas, which the government, without any, the, any of the protections of its own statutory processes and with no um, consultation, unilaterally determined to be residential red zone. And, and that was the point that the court made. If they'd done a recovery plan, at least people would have had a say. At least people who were in the red zone, who were insured, could have been asked, do you mind that we pay the same to your neighbour who was uninsured? Because I tell you, I wouldn't, I wouldn't mind at all. I actually think that that's the only fair way to help people um, move on, especially when I know my neighbour's story. So judgments aren't necessary in this case. Fairness and consistency. The government made area-wide decisions to create the residential red zone, and they should make area-wide offers to people that they want to leave. So I will put that motion. All those in favour say aye. aye. Those opposed say no. That's carried. Thank you very much. Um,